This is Pace Per Mile. For more on the latest news, reviews, check out PacePerMile.com. Like us on Facebook and join in the conversation on Twitter. With host Chris Nicholas, this is Pace Per Mile. Welcome back to Pace Per Mile. I'm Chris Nicholas. Joining us this week, Jim Dreyer. You probably have heard his name over the years. Ultra marathon athlete has swam countless lakes put so much time into preparing for his next event and been on the news quite a bit. Well, he's back on the news and we're chatting with him today on Pace Per Mile. And we're also going to talk with the beneficiary of what he is going to be doing in August of this year. So Jim Dreyer, welcome to Pace Per Mile. Hello. Happy to be here, Chris. Thank you. Glad to have you here. And then we also have on the line Bev Crandall Rice. Bev is the development director for the Lakeshore Habitat for Humanity in Michigan. And Jim, we're going to talk a little bit uh, on the latter side of the interview today about how they're going to benefit, but we want to definitely welcome Bev to the show. Bev, how are you today? Good. Thank you very much. Well, Jim, I think for our audience, we should start by looking back to what you have accomplished. People talk about the MIT in Michigan, and the the state uh, looks like a hand, and you have literally tackled every lake that surrounds the state of Michigan. You have crossed it not only one way, but you have tackled uh, some of the lakes the other way as well. Back in, uh, I think it was 1999, you crossed the first lake. Was that right? Uh, 1998, Lake Michigan. 65 miles? 65 miles, correct. Of just swimming across one lake. Tell us a little bit about (laughs) why, the experience, and then we'll go into the other lakes as well and then uh, dive into what you're going to be doing next. Uh, Yeah, I guess just real briefly for the listeners who are not real familiar with the Great Lakes, uh, yes, uh, living here in Michigan is a great place for open water swimming and marathon swimming because we're literally surrounded by these freshwater seas. And, you know, they call them lakes because they're fresh water, but they're larger than a lot of bodies of water on this planet that are actually called seas, that are salt water. So, you know, 65 miles across Lake Michigan was three times further than swimming the English Channel, and of course everybody's familiar with that. My story is kind of a funny one because I nearly drowned when I was three years old. My sister pulled me out of the water, saved my life. I make sure she gets a birthday card every year on her birthday. And I was afraid of the water all my life. It was my biggest fear in life. And finally, when I was 32, I took beginner swimming lessons. And I guess uh, this goes to prove you can teach old dogs new tricks because just two years later, I set out to swim across Lake Michigan and become the first person to cross its midsection between the states of Wisconsin and Michigan. And I made it. Of course, it wasn't without its perils. But I guess the biggest obstacle was it was a 50-mile point-to-point crossing, but with the currents, it added an extra 15 miles. So I prepared for a 50-mile swim and ended up being 65. And I know the listeners, you know, there's a lot of ultra athletes out there. You're you're my type of people. And, uh, you know, if you can imagine preparing for an event like this and then all of a sudden there's that much more event that you uh, have to complete that you didn't count on. Uh, It can be quite an obstacle. And when you're out there swimming, do you realize, okay, I have this many miles to go? Well, you know, it depends. I have, and most of my early events, I had a support boat, and we can get to this later. Later in my career, I started doing this stuff solo. (laughs) That's a whole other thing. But there were times I wanted my crew to tell me how far I've gone and how far I had yet to go. And then there's other times I just don't want to know. I'm more concerned with my performance. You know, like if my stroke starts looking like it's falling apart, let me know. If uh, my strokes per minute, you know, drops off, let me know. But I just, I'm going to do the best I can and I don't want to know where I'm at. So it kind of goes both ways. But when we got toward the end of that swim, I remember it was the second day. It took me 40 hours, uh, almost 41 hours to swim the 65 miles. But just before sunset, that second day, we spotted shore, which is the greatest feeling imaginable when they yell land ho from the boat. And I'm thinking, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Well, you've still got another 14 miles when you spot shore. But what I didn't realize is we were getting into our toughest currents. And I was literally on a treadmill, and it was pushing me north. And so I ended up swimming those last miles in a big arc to try to get into shore. And that's where the most of those extra miles came in. And so I kept thinking, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. And my crew was telling me, Jim, you got to swim harder, you got to swim harder. And I started to realize after a while, well, they're telling me this because I'm not making any progress. 
And so this started before sundown, and it was almost 1 o'clock the next day before I finally made it into shore. So you're at the tail end of a swim like that. Hypothermia is taking its toll. You're sick to your stomach. You're hallucinating from exertion and lack of sleep. All this is going on, and then you're in the toughest part of the swim because of the current. So, you know, um, the audience can relate. Uh, that's a lot of times toward the finish line. That's where they separate the men from the boys, and you really have to suck it up. I think you've defined ultra for our audience there. When you're out there, though, there are the safety nets that you have while you're out there, though. You have uh, the swimsuit that you're wearing. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and when you have, obviously, people out there with you, you're not necessarily always in danger. They can Somebody can jump in and say, hey, you know what, we need to pull them back. But then you decided to do some solo swims without those safety nets. Is that scarier for you? Is it, is it more of a challenge? What's going through your head at that point? Well, definitely, you know, as, as you uh, alluded to, Chris, you know, you are doing it without a safety net. So the safety factor definitely changes. But I think w where I really saw solo as, as the way to go, I, I think it depends on what your quest is and what the body of water is you're swimming, but it was Lake Superior. I chased Lake Superior from 2001 to 2005 until I finally got across it, and I made it on my sixth attempt. And in the first five attempts where I fell short, I actually set three world records in the attempts where I fell short, which kind of showed you the scope of the quest. But in, the, in those times where I fell short, I mean, we were nearly shipwrecked a couple of times. We would get into these huge storms where um, everybody on the boat, their lives were in danger. And I'd have eight to ten people on my support boat, and I was responsible for their lives. So I did not take that lightly. And the plug gets pulled quicker. You know, the more people whose lives are at stake, it's that much quicker they're going to pull the plug on an event. So I started to see the writing on the wall. If I'm ever going to make it across Superior, you know, I need to do this solo. And that's where it got really interesting. I mean, I'm standing on the shore of Lake Superior in 2005. I've got a 10-foot dinghy attached to my waist, 250 pounds of supplies, and a GPS. And I have to find my way 60 miles due north, along the 85th meridian to Canada. I have to find my way to Canada, and I'm alone. There's no safety net. My crew is on shore with a laptop computer, and I've got a transponder on the dinghy I'm pulling, so people could get online and they could see my location, but I didn't know where I was. You know, So my crew would, they asked me, well, how do we know when you're in trouble? And the answer is, you really don't. So we just had to set some kind of parameters. And I said, if I'm ever more than 10 miles off course, I'm probably in trouble, <laughs> and that's when they would send help. But a lot can go wrong without being 10 miles off course, and it did, and we can go into some of those details if you would like. So Lake Michigan back in 1998, the following year you tackled Lake Huron in 1999. Fairly easy swim for you? Oh, no. <laughs> no, you know, it's never, ever easy. Uh, these Great Lakes all have a personality of their own, and uh, all of them can be pretty ornery. Um, Lake Huron, I would say the only thing that was, well, I hate even using the word easy, but in comparison to Lake Michigan the year before where an extra 15 miles was, was added because of the currents, I kept the straightest line I ever kept in any of my swims in Lake Huron. It was 51 miles point to point, and I only ended up swimming 52.3, so just an extra 1.3 miles. <laughs> However, when we got close to the Canadian shoreline, it's really shallow and rocky and turbulent, and my support boat couldn't get any closer than about 3.5 miles to shore. So at the tail end of this 52-mile swim, I'm on my own swimming alone. The, har the local harbor master was supposed to come out and escort me in because he knew the waters, by then it was dark, and he got scared and didn't show up. I was left on my own. And as I'm swimming in, uh, my legs cramped up. Um, I, you know, I wasn't able to eat. I wasn't able to uh, resupply the glycogen supplies to my muscle tissue. My legs completely cramped up. They sank, and I was swimming with just my arms, knowing that if my arms gave out, you know, I was going to go down. So um, it took a long time, it, probably three hours longer than the crowd on shore expected, so the Coast Guard's looking for me, both the American and the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, when I finally did fight my way to shore, I come out of the water, and there's a great crowd. There's about 3,000 people on the beach. It's just before midnight, 
and they're still there. Um, but there's a group of people sweeping the swimming area looking for my body. So wow. it was kind of like showing up at your own funeral, and I'd just kind of pop out of the water and said, hey, rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> um, a surreal experience. We're talking with Jim Dreyer here on Pace Per Mile today. And, Jim, one of the thoughts while you're just talking about maybe being lost at, in a lake, one of the Great Lakes, is the resources that have to go into something like this or the resources that are called upon, like you're looking at people are searching for your body and so on and so forth. I mean, nobody can just say, I'm going to cross a, a lake. They have to get certain permissions from both the Canadian side as well as the U.S. side in something like this, correct? Yes especially if you're crossing international borders, and things have changed considerably, as you might imagine, since 911. Um, prior to the terrorist attacks in New York, it, it, it was a, a much simpler procedure. And it's not that the American and the Canadian authorities still won't work with you, but there's a lot more I's to dot and a lot more T's to cross. Um, I always work with the Coast Guard, though. Uh, they, you know, it's, their, it's their job. They, they really need to know what's going on out there. And um, it's, ki it's kind of a funny relationship because a lot of these people either love you or they hate you. Uh, the ones that hate you, it's because you're creating more work for them. But then again, a lot of um, men and women who join the Coast Guard, that's what they're about. They, they do enjoy doing their job, or if they didn't, they'd be doing something else. And they enjoy the thrill. And, um, and consequently, I've done safety videos for the Coast Guard, water safety videos, um, I've been uh, interviewed and featured in a lot of their art articles and their publications. And so, you know, we kind of uh, work with each other. And uh, I try, you know, I never stop appreciating what they do. Uh, the, water, the water rescue people with the Coast Guard are incredible. And, um, you know, they lay their lives on the line all the time. And I, I have a great respect for that. Let's go through some of the other lakes, and then we'll get to the challenge today, because I know Bev is, is listening on the line with us, and, and I know she knows a little bit about you. But, but, Bev, just a quick question to interject to you is, after hearing about what Jim has done in the past and what he's going to be doing, do you think he's kind of crazy or not? We do, but we love every part of it, every part of it. We're just amazed and really feel privileged to engage in this rare opportunity. Um, we think so highly of Jim and what he is giving to Habitat for Humanity, and we're just excited about this venture together. Jim, over the years, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron in 99, uh, Erie you crossed in 2000, that was 30 miles as part of a duathlon. You crossed Lake Ontario, which was 56 miles in 2000. And then Lake Michigan, the full length of it in 2003, and then obviously part of what you had mentioned a few minutes ago, that uh, six attempts to finally finish and complete Lake Superior in 2005. This was not all for just Jim Dreyer. It was to support charities along the way, correct? That's correct. And, and you know, really, that's what keeps you going in your darkest hours. I mean, I've, I've always said this. You know, I'm definitely a driven person, as I know most of the, the listening audiences as well. But when the goal is just about yourself and you are the only person uh, with, with something to gain from your event, when the going gets really, really tough and it stops being fun, and it will, <laughs> it's much easier to quit than if your quest is larger than yourself and it benefits others. And when it's larger than yourself, that is what keeps you going in your darkest hours. It really is. It's that emotional attachment that keeps you going because there's a time where your body's had as much as it wants to take and your body wants to quit. And the next thing that kicks in is your mental toughness because you've conditioned your mind to not quit no matter how tough it gets on your body. But when you're going more than two days without sleep and the exertion is piling up on top of the sleep deprivation, your brain starts to kind of turn to oatmeal. And that mental toughness can start to wane too. And when your mind and body has had all it can take, the thing that keeps you going is your emotional attachment. And if you're emotionally attached to a cause that's larger than you, that's what keeps you going in your darkest hours. That's what I've found. 
and some of the accomplishments that you have achieved have been for records. Some have been disputed as well, not necessarily because people think you didn't complete it, but because wearing a wetsuit doesn't always match up with the record, right? Can you touch on that a little bit for our listening audience? Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and, and we probably should because um, if there ever was any controversy, and it's kind of funny that sometimes there's controversy when you're doing things for charity, but sometimes there is. The whole wetsuit thing, I think, is really apple and oranges. You know, back in 1875 when the English Channel was first crossed, you know, it was a swimsuit and a swim cap. And so they, like the English Channel Association, said, okay, that's the official uniform if you want to be recognized to officially cross the English Channel. Well, since that time and since times have changed, there is a second association now that governs swims in the English Channel that does allow wetsuits. So even in the English Channel, they don't even agree on it. I will say this. With this type of distance swimming, it is a different animal, and this is what I mean by apples and oranges. When you're wearing a wetsuit, you are more buoyant, so there's the advantage. Mm -hmm. But you are more restricted in your movement. There's the disadvantage. So if you're swimming a short distance and you're a strong swimmer, I believe a wetsuit is an advantage because you are going to be more buoyant and you're strong enough to fight through that restrictedness of the suit that's like every time you stroke, you're stretching rubber across your shoulders. Now, you could sit at your desk with a rubber band and start stretching it back and forth, and you'll say, well, that's not tough. But after two or three days, you can hardly move that rubber band. Yeah. So the longer the swim goes, the more of a disadvantage the suit becomes, not to mention the suit takes all your skin off. So now you're swimming like, well, after my Lake Huron swim, I had lost so much skin on my midsection, I was treated in the hospital as a burn patient had to be wrapped in bandages for three weeks, couldn't wear a shirt. Really tough to swim when it's been like you went through a fire. Really tough to swim that way. But the longer you swim, that buoyancy factor, which is an advantage, it definitely pales compared to how much harder you're working because of how restrictive the suit is. So when you start doing the longer distances, anybody who does what I do or close to what I do will tell you the suit is a disadvantage, not an advantage. If you're going to go out and do an Ironman triathlon 2.4 miles or less, well, it's probably an advantage. That being said, I don't lose sight of the fact that you do need the wetsuit to hold in your body heat. And you're not going to make it if hypothermia gets to a certain point. But I always believe and I always say that when you're doing these long events, it shouldn't be about how well your body retains heat. You're, it's a test of athleticism and you're actually working harder in that suit. Um, I don't believe it's a test of, well, let's see how far I can go before hypothermia kills me. Let's see how fit I am, and let's see what I can do athletically. So that's kind of my answer to that controversy. Makes complete <laughs> sense. And people really should not complain that, you know, because like you had said, you're doing it for charity, you're completing it. Obviously, you're not being towed along, and a lot of these times you're doing it solo. So it's a pretty incredible story that we're talking with you today. But that also leads into what's next on your plate, and that ties us into some of the news releases this week, bringing you back in the news and talking about Lake St. Clair. You are going to be tackling yet another challenge coming up this August. So for our listeners, the reason why we're talking to you today is because not only are you training for this event in August, but also we're going to try to follow you over the next couple of months while you are training, get updates so that we can take part with you, you know, seeing you finish this. But, you know, Jim, looking at the notes from uh, the release and all of the news information, this isn't just Jim Dreyer crossing a lake. This is Jim Dreyer hauling a ton of weight <laughs> behind him to cross that lake. What are you going to be doing in August this year? I'm really excited about this next event. And this is going to be something a little bit different for me. I got a taste of what I refer to as strength training when I swam across Superior pulling 250 pounds of my own supplies and in 2003, I swam the length of Lake Michigan over the course of 30 days, uh, 422 miles. And then I pulled an average of 75 pounds of supplies and an inflatable kayak from my ankles. So I got a taste of the strength training, but this is going to, uh, strength swimming, but this is going to take it to another level. 
last summer I kayaked across the country with a friend from Lake Michigan to the Gulf of Mexico, and then we built a home with Habitat for Humanity in, uh, in the hurricane-stricken area in New Orleans with Habitat for Humanity and just absolutely fell in love with this program. And I thought, when I return to my home state of Michigan, i got to do something there. Well, Lake St. Clair is not officially a Great Lake, but it's part of the Great Lakes chain. And at 22 miles to cross it, it is a mile further than the English Channel. Well, I hooked up with Habitat for Humanity of Michigan, and since then have been partnering with some of their individual affiliates, such as Lakeshore Habitat for Humanity, and of course, Bev, the development director, is online with us, and we'll talk more to her, I'm sure. And the plan was... I'm going to haul a ton of bricks across this lake and and finish in Detroit, our largest city. And we're going to sell those bricks to help fund building projects across the state of Michigan. And it's part of what we're calling the Rebuild Michigan campaign because as a lot of people are aware, with the financial difficulties over the recent years, no state really has been hit harder than the state of Michigan. And so there's a lot of work to do here, and there's a lot of Michigan families feeling a lot of pain, and they're trying to keep their heads above water. So symbolically, these bricks, you know, I'm going to be trying to keep my head above water, and I'm going to be feeling a lot of pain, similar to these families. But, you know, I want to believe that together we can all pull together, and instead of sinking with the weight of our burdens, we can be the bricks that rebuild lives, rebuild communities, and rebuild this great state of Michigan. And the Cornerstone of Strength Swim Campaign is what you're calling it, correct? Correct. The Cornerstone Strength Swim Campaign, yes. And it cost about $80,000 to build a new home. And we're going to bring in Bev Crandall Rice, the development director for the Lakeshore Habitat for Humanity. Bev, is that the number to build a new home that we're trying to target? We did. We did come up with that goal. It is fairly equivalent to a, a new build or a restoration in our area. However, we do critical home repairs also to make a better quality of life for families and do really support those low-income, hardworking families in those housing needs. So not only is it new homes, but we also do, again, that any type of home repair that can aid in you know, having a safe, decent, affordable home for themselves and their families. So Jim's effort of crossing Lake St. Clair, and, and in the back of our minds, I think some of us don't understand that it, it just doesn't go to building a new home, and I'm glad you clarified that. We're pretty familiar with Habitat for Humanity, the name, but to be able to say, okay, maybe there is a home already built, we just need to refurbish that home, Jim's effort and, and his fundraising will go towards that as well. Yes, we are. We will put it toward those housing needs in our area at the time in which the campaign is complete. So we are excited, and we know together, as Jim stated, we we can help eliminate substandard housing in our community, and even broader on a national level. And Jim, you are working with other affiliates like Lakeshore Habitat for Humanity for homes in their areas as well. That is correct. Lakeshore Habitat for Humanity is my very first partner. They came charging out of the gate on this. We have been accomplishing a lot uh, along the, the, the west coast of Michigan, along Lake Michigan, which is their service area. But yes, I am partnering with other Habitat for Humanity affiliates across the state of Michigan to basically do the same thing. The, the plan basically is we hook up with other community partners like area churches, businesses, civic groups, schools, colleges, swim teams, swim clubs, and they sell these bricks, um, kind of like you know kids selling candy bars at school. Another thing, like church youth groups are doing watch parties where I'll be streaming live, and, and I think some of the listeners may appreciate this, we'll be streaming live from my support boat. Now, it, it's kind of boring to watch a guy just stroke through the water for 30 straight hours, which is what I think this is going to take. But at these watch parties, these kids, and it doesn't just have to be kids, they're out taking pledges to stay active for the entire 30 hours that I'm going to be pulling these bricks. So they might be running or walking around a track. They might be riding a stationary bike, and then I'm up on the screen. And they're saying, come on, Jim, hurry up and finish so I can get off this bike. Those community partners are very, very important, and we're doing that across the state of Michigan. And I know that you know the listening audience is, is much broader than the state of Michigan. I mentioned how I worked with uh, the New Orleans area, Habitat for Humanity, this past summer. 
believe me, I am always open to helping Habitat for Humanity anywhere in the world. And I know I'm only one guy, but I find a way to to stretch myself. <laughs> and uh, if there's something that can be done in any community to help, hey, I want to hear about it. And you are putting yourself out on the line there because this is a lot of weight to cross a lake and, and pulled from, from one person. You know, we've had various people that we've interviewed here on Pace Per Mile, you know, Dick and Ricky Hoyt, of course, and, and Dick is, is pulling Ricky in a boat during the triathlons and Ironmans. That's terrific, but, yes. But that's, you know, that's a, a person, and, you know, 80 to 100 to 150 pounds of, of weight you know, around that range, you're pulling 500 pounds. Uh, how are you training to do this? Uh, and then we'll talk about how people can help not only financially, but take part in, in, in getting you ready for the event. Okay. Well, actually, it's 2,000 pounds that I'll be pulling. It's a ton. It's, um, it's four dinghies, each with 500 pounds of bricks. I'm calling it my train of pain. <laughs> so how I'm training, well, it's kind of funny. Yesterday, we had a media event in conjunction with my announcement, and we went out to a local lake here in West Michigan, and we piled a bunch of people, a lot of Habitat for Humanity personnel, onto a pontoon boat. And so all together, this was definitely over 5,000 pounds, and I pulled it across the lake kind of as a demonstration for the media. It was kind of a fun event. So I think that would classify as strength training. But on a regular basis, I've got this great big bucket. And if you go to the website, cornerstonestrength.org, you can see pictures posted of my training device. I just simply call it the bucket. It's this big bucket with a small hole drilled in the bottom. I attach it to my ankles with bungee cords, and I pull it through the water for hours and hours and hours. So like this afternoon, I'll be out there for five, six hours pulling that. When I reach my peak, I'll be pulling it in training. I'll be uh, pulling it for about 18 hours. And it's like pulling around a small building. I mean, it is a ton of resistance. And so strength training is important, cross training is important. Um, I'm doing about a, well, I'm working my way up to doing a, a century on a mountain bike every week for cross training. I did 50 miles yesterday. Last fall I was doing a century on a mountain bike once a week. So um, I'm getting back to that on my cross training day. So, yeah, the training is intense. It's about four days of training per week, and that doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people until you realize those four days I'm basically training all day. I mean, it's all day, and, and sometimes it's more than, you know, when I reach my peak, it'll be going into the night and into the next day. And uh, so those days of rest are very important, too. And I know we could have an entire show on this next question, but I'm sure some of the listeners are thinking in the back of their minds, wow, I want to do something like this. But <laughs> I'll tell you, Jim, there's got to be some sort of bullet points that you will write down on, a, on somebody's piece of paper and say, okay, to be able to do something like this, you have to. And, and if you can complete that question for me, that, that would be great. Because there's got to be the safety, uh, obviously the training, as you just talked about a moment ago. But somebody has to just have a mental will to do something like this, too. Yes, and, you know, you just asked a very, very insightful uh, question, Chris. I think you have a future in this business because it, that is very, very true. And if there ever was an audience that would say, yes, I want to do this, uh, it would be your audience. The one thing I would say, and, and, and there's always a half a dozen people every year at least that will come to me and say, hey, can you help me? I want to, you know, here's a quest that I, I want to accomplish. Can you train me? Can you give me some advice? And, and I always work with people whenever I can. And I always tell them this, you know, it is, it's a lonely thing because the commitment is all-encompassing. And, you know, I'm not trying to make the listening audience feel sorry for me here. That's not the intent. I'm not trying to, to get a date here. But really, it is all-encompassing. I'm single. I have no children. When somebody tells, I always ask a person who comes to me to ask, you know, for training advice and want, wants me to coach them, my first question is, well, tell me about your home situation, your family situation. And if they say, well, I'm married and I have three kids under the age of six, I'm concerned. Because I always tell, you know, I always say, and I supported the Big Brothers Big Sisters organization for years, if you choose to be a parent, that is the most important job in the world. It is the most important job in the world. And I wouldn't take that lightly. That has to come first. I have chosen not to do that. 
And it is a lot to juggle. If you have a family that should be your top priority, the amount of training and how this quest becomes all-encompassing, it is going to take you away from your family. It is. And so that's a choice to be made. And I have a really hard time condoning, you know, to say to a person, yes, you need to take at least a year away from your family to prepare for this. I really, I can't condone saying that to them. So that is the biggest thing right there. 49 years old, and you have accomplished so much, and and you're inspiring so many. Very impressed, Jim. You are 49 years old, right? (laughs) <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. Yes, I am. <laughs> Funny thing is, I turned 50 11 days after this next quest. I thought I better get it in before I turn 50, because then who knows what's going to happen. I mean, and actually, I'm joking. I've, I, don't, I don't get caught up in age. I'm, I'm improving every day as a swimmer, as a biker, as a paddler. About the only thing I can say that I actually am not as good at as I used to be or not improving is running, unfortunately. And it's just, you know, the knees have been taking a beating over the years um, between running, the martial arts, years of playing semi-pro baseball. But that's more just the abuse they've taken more than just turning 50. We can keep getting better. I didn't plan to do some big monumental event to mark my 50th birthday. It just worked out that way. But it's kind of become like a Jack Lane type thing. So mm-hmm. he lived to be 96, so I'm telling people i got another 46 years of doing this crazy exactly. stuff. Exactly. Or more. <laughs> Jim, before we wrap up here and tell people how they can get involved, how they can support financially, Bev, I'd like to bring you back in just for a moment and ask that same question if if after Jim is all done with this, some things that people can keep in the back of their mind that maybe they can't help financially right now or they can't participate right now. Or like we had talked about, some of our listeners are all across the country or all across the world. What sort of the things that they can do if they're listening to the segment today that they can do in their local communities to get involved with Habitat for Humanity? Well, thanks for asking that question. Really, Habitat for Humanity since 1976 has been changing lives through housing. You know, the the problem, you know, is far-reaching. There's at least 1.6 billion people living in poverty housing. 51 million Americans, one in six people, lack the decent place to live. So the problem with housing is, is all over. And the strength in our model for Habitat for Humanity is bringing all types of people together to make a difference. And that can be through those donations or going on board and buying a brick because we need to fill those boats before Jim goes, but also volunteering. We, The majority of the work that's done on each home along, walking alongside those homeowners, is volunteers. So volunteer in your community and, and get involved and be part of something locally, but looking at a global perspective on how much can make a difference. And for those in the area that you serve, what's your website that they can go to? Our website is lakeshorehabitat.org. And so www.lakeshorehabitat.org. Great. And, can and find the out national all kinds website. Of information. It'll link you to, to Jim's um, cornerstonestrength.org email and, or a website. And we really just want to, you know, partner together wherever people are at to make a difference in our communities. That's great. And the national website address, what is that for some of our listeners throughout the country? That is Habitat.org. Excellent. Jim, you're doing something absolutely incredible, not only for yourself, but for everybody, the charities and organizations that you work with. How can people help First, financially, and then second, coming out and supporting you. Thank you, Chris, for that. And, and, you know, I'll never say it better than Bev just did. But, uh, yes, definitely people can help out by buying a brick. These bricks are going to be cool because, uh, you know, not only is it a souvenir, if you will, of of a world record, but it's going to be a constant reminder to the purchaser of the good work that they were a part of and how they helped change lives. And for those who are people of faith, it's got uh, the verse from the Bible, Philippians 4.13 on it, which is a verse I live by. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. These things also make great paperweights, so you can look at that on your desk every day and hopefully be inspired and take pride in the fact that you were part of this. You're part of the team in changing lives. 
And for those listeners who haven't been on site with Habitat for Humanity before on a build site, let me tell you, it is a spiritual experience. It really is. Once again, if you're a person of faith, you believe that all of us are stones or bricks or stones, however you want to say it, in God's house and Christ himself is the cornerstone. So on the building site, everybody contributes a brick. Everybody who comes together as God's family contributes a brick to build this house. And when we're done, there's a monument standing there, a monument to God's work that had been done on that ground, which I'll go as far as to say the ground on which a Habitat for Humanity home is built is like sacred ground. And for generations, you can drive past that house, and it stands there as a monument of the good work that was done there. So I became a believer when we built that home down in in New Orleans in the hurricane-stricken area. And since then, I've been on other build sites, and I'm going to be on many, many more. So volunteering is a great way to get involved as well. But please buy a brick. (laughs) Excellent. And that website, one more time for us, Bev? It's cornerstonestrengths.org. Excellent. That is, yep, the campaign uh, website. And again, ours is www.lakeshorehabitat.org. All right, Jim Dreyer, the shark they call you, an ultra marathon <laughs> athlete. You've done so much. We will continue to follow you not only through August, but also on your future adventures. And then, Bev, obviously, you have our support here at Pace Per Mile that whatever we can do locally and nationally to help out Habitat for Humanity. And it starts right now with encouraging our listeners to go to the website again, cornerstonestrength.org. Jim, we'll be talking to you in the future if that's all right. Absolutely. I welcome all the listeners to the team. I enjoy the company. And thanks for joining us for another segment of Pace Per Mile. I'm Chris Nichols. At Pace Per Mile, we want to share your story. Do you know someone that has a compelling topic to share with the listeners? Help us tell your story or their story by emailing us today. Info at PacePerMile.com. That's info at PacePerMile.com.